This video will start to cover section 2 of chapter 3 in your book. We'll cover process creation and termination and the 2 and 5 state process models. We'll take a look at process suspension in the next video. So first things first, let's take a look at a couple of terms and be clear about how we're going to use them. A trace, in general, will list a sequence of instructions. For processes, it will simply be the list of instructions that execute for that particular process. For processors, the trace will show how the traces of the various processes are interleaved. We'll see examples of these in just a few slides. The dispatcher is just a little program that switches the processor from one process to another. Now let's take a look at some terms about process creation. Process spawning is just the OS creating a process at the request of another process. Uh, the parent process is that original process that requests the creation of another, and the child process is the new process itself. So, now that we know some things about creating processes, we need to take a look at how to terminate them. There has to be a means for a process to indicate that it's completed doing what it's doing. A batch job should include a halt instruction or an explicit OS service call for termination. For an interactive application, the action of a user can indicate when the process is completed. So, for example, the user logs off of a website, quits the application, that's what terminates our process. So here is that process trace example I promised you. What we're looking at here is just the list of instructions each process executes in the form of the memory addresses of those instructions. Process A starts at 5,000 and continues on from there. Process B starts at 8,000 and process C at 12,000. I should mention that the dispatcher will be assumed to start at address 100 for the rest of this video. Now let's take a look at a processor trace. The blocks in blue indicate that the dispatcher is running. Each process has a time slice, or amount of time it can run before it's switched out so another process can have some time. We start with process A at address 5000, which executes for a while until it times out. Then the dispatcher takes over to switch to another process, in this case called process B, which runs until it executes an input-output request. Process B has to wait until it gets the return from that request, so the dispatcher starts process C at address 12000. Process C runs until it times out, then process A gets dispatched again. One thing to notice is that when process A times out, the dispatcher starts process C again, skipping process B, because process B is still waiting for its input-output request to return. The two-state process model shows a very simple way that processes can be dispatched and run. When a new process is spawned, it's put into the not running state. When it's time for that process to run, the dispatcher puts it into the running state. When it times out or has a need to wait for some reason, like process B making it its input-output call, it's paused and put into the not running state again, and the next process is dispatched into the running state. When a process finishes or is halted, it exits. Here's a very simple way to implement this idea. We can have a queue that a process gets added to. Then the dispatcher just moves the next process in the queue to the processor to ex execute until it finishes or times out. If it finishes, it exits the loop and otherwise gets added back to the back of the queue. Unfortunately, this won't work very well since it assumes that every process is always ready to run. Remember process B, which is waiting for an I.O. call to run? This causes a problem since if we just try to dispatch it every time it reaches the front of the queue, we'll waste a lot of time just to find out that it needs to go back to the back of the line again. We can solve this problem by splitting up the ready state into ready and blocked states. This leads us to the five-state process model. This model is similar to the two-state idea, but takes care of some problems. In this model, a process is spawned and enters the new state, generally meaning that the process control block has been created, but the process has not yet been moved into main memory. Next, it moves into the ready state to wait until the dispatcher puts it into the running state. Now a process could just time out and move back to the ready state, or, as in the case of process B waiting for an I.O. request to return, it could need to wait for an event and move to the blocking state. Now all of the processes that aren't waiting for specific events can keep on getting dispatched, and a process that is waiting for an event stays in the blocking state until that event occurs, moving it back to the ready state. Finally, when a process terminates, either because its execution is finished, a user halts it, or it errors out, it moves to the exit state. This slide gives us another view of what's happening with our three processes and the dispatcher. This shows us process B entering the blocked state when it makes that I.O. call. After that, the dispatcher alternates between processes A and C until process B returns to the ready state. 
Well, that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll wrap up Chapter 3, Section 2 with a quick look at the idea of suspending processes.